Well, good evening, guys. Uh, I'm Dustin. Um, you're stuck with me tonight, so get out while you can. The doors are still open, so I'm just kidding. But uh, like I said in the beginning, Rich is uh, at the Senior Pastors Conference. They're probably in a study, I imagine, tonight. Um, so just be praying for those guys. Uh, him and Gene are both there. They'll be back uh, tomorrow or Friday, sometime, uh, sometime this week. So, um, so if you need a Bible, actually, I forgot. Um, most of you guys know this Wednesday night cruise. You guys are like, uh, you guys are, I was going to say OGs, but I don't know if you can say OGs from the pulpit, but I just did. So uh, there's, there's some Bibles back there. Uh, Adam will get you one if you need one. Um, but if you already have your Bibles, open up to 1 Peter chapter 4. I guess it just depends on if, if uh, Bill hit the record button or not before I said that. I guess there's worse things to say. First Peter chapter 4, let's pray. Jesus, we thank you so much for this night, and Lord, we think about um, it being Wednesday night, and, and really, uh, we, we couldn't get enough of, of your word on Sunday, and we can't get enough of your word all week, and so we need um, a pick-me-up, or we need to hear your voice in the middle of the week to, to get us through till Sunday, and we thank you, Lord, that your word is so powerful and it's sharper than the two-edged sword, so faithful to speak to us and encourage us and instruct us. And, and we're so, so glad to be called your children and be able to sit here and hear from you. Lord, we thank you that the, the words that Peter even wrote were inspired by you. The things that we'll, we'll talk about tonight are inspired by you. And the, the way, if we get anything from tonight, will be because of you, Lord, it'll be because your Holy Spirit is ministering to our hearts and speaking to us and teaching us and making things clear and revealing your word to us. And so we're just thankful. We're so happy, Lord, to be here. And we're so thankful that, you, that that's who you are, um, wanting to speak to us. And so bless our time tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 4. And if you're familiar with Peter, 1 Peter, and if you look down in your Bible and you see chapter 4, you see that there's a lot of... Uh, headings. If you have a, a New King James, you'll see uh, starting in chapter 3, you know, Christ's sufferings, serving, uh, serving for God's glory, suffering for God's glory. And so usually when someone says open their Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 4, it's not really like a, oh yes, 1 Peter chapter 4, sufferings. Um, it's going to be a great time tonight. Because um, because what what Peter what we're going to talk about tonight is Peter's addressing the idea of sufferings, but not just suffering for the sake of suffering, but but suffering for righteousness' sake, for for doing good, which is never an encouraging. I mean, it is encouraging. It will, will be encouraged, but if you look at it and just in its context, you're thinking, I don't like to suffer. I want I do everything I can not to suffer. <laughs> I do. If you we're going to talk a little bit about service. You know, I want to be served. I don't want to serve. I want to, I want to be served, and I want to avoid suffering. That's kind of like a, our ideal life. Um, at least that's for me. Maybe, maybe you like suffering. Um, I'm not a really a big fan of it, but I'm sure glad that, uh, that we have chapters like this to kind of get us through it. And so First Peter is a book. You guys know um, Peter's life. If you've gone through the Gospels, Peter, one of the disciples that Jesus chose, one of the 12, a fisherman, who Jesus came one day and said, you know, come follow me. And it says that they left their nets and they followed him. They followed this crazy guy who they weren't quite sure even who he was, uh, but they saw something in him and they, they, there was a presence there. There was an authority there that they had never seen before. And they thought, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm dropping my nets and I'm following him. And they did. And Peter was one of those guys. And we're not going to spend the time necessarily going through Peter's life, but but there are some very critical things that Peter um, was involved in. He was, he was part, of, part of the original 12. He was the one who would have the, the famous saying after the disciples, um, so many disciples left Jesus after Jesus said, you know, you have to eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. And people kind of got freaked out and like, I'm out of here. And, and Jesus turned to his disciples and said, will you guys leave me as well? And, and the, the great statement of Peter saying, Lord, where are we going to go? You have the words of eternal life. Like you're like, we can't go anywhere. And he's also famous for denying Jesus three times, you know? So Peter has like this, this roller coaster relationship early on with, his, with Jesus and with the other disciples. 
And maybe that's why I like Peter so much is because he, you never know what he's going to say. You, you don't know what kind of trouble he's going to get into. You don't know, what, what, you know what's the next thing he's going to do. And I, I look at my own life and think, man, I'm sure glad Peter is in the Bible because if it was just like Paul, Paul has this like awesome experiences all the time. I mean, we have one chapter, you know, Romans 7, he kind of opens up a little bit. For the most part, Paul's like invincible. <laughs> you know, he's, he's like a superhero. And, uh, but Peter, we look at Peter, like deny Jesus, put his foot in his mouth. You know, um, you know, he even, he even kind of got a little bit legalistic at the end or not at the end, but you know, somewhere in the middle there where he was eating with some, uh, some Gentiles and the Jews walked in and he got up and went to a different table and got rebuked by Paul. So Peter has a, has an interesting story, a very, very full story, very, um, you know, he's been on one, on each of the, the, uh, the, you know, the, the curve of saying something really awesome and then saying something really dumb, which is what I do every day, usually. So, you know, I can relate to it. And Peter, later in his life, after being filled with the Spirit, after, you know, he had denied Jesus, Jesus restored him on that shore in Capernaum, that, you know, at the Sea of Galilee. Um, you know, we'll talk about it a little bit as the, as the time goes on about uh, Peter saying, or Jesus telling Peter, you know, Peter, do you love me? Jesus, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. But um, Jesus restoring them, and then that day of Pentecost, Peter being filled with the Holy Spirit. And then you have the book of Acts where Peter was used mightily, used greatly. First, first disciple to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. We can thank Peter for that. Um, Paul would become the maybe the apostle or the pastor to the Gentiles, but Peter was the first one after having a, a dream of bacon and uh, pulled pork and, uh, you know, saw the Mississippi pulled pork or something, you know, before Mississippi was a state. Um, you know, he saw, he saw these animals that he had never, he, he thought they were unclean. I'd never touch these animals. And, and God says, you know, get up, kill and eat, you know. And obviously, you know, it wasn't really speaking of bacon, um, although that's probably what I've done before. Before I went to Cornelius' house, I probably would have said, okay, Lord, give me permission to eat bacon. I'm going to cook some up. Then I'll uh, go to the Gentile's house. But he goes and he preaches the gospel, and the whole house, Cornelius and his whole house gets saved. Um, so tremendous, God uses him tremendously, despite his failures, despite the things that he says, some of the things that he did. God uses him greatly to reach the, reach the world, reach the you know he was part of part of something that that was unique in that that God had filled him with the Holy Spirit and empowered him to do something that he normally couldn't do on his own, that he wouldn't have done on his own. And he impacted and changed the whole world. He, he was part of the group where the, where the Pharisees or the people in, in Jerusalem would say, these guys have filled the city with a doctrine. They've turned the, the, you know, they've turned the city upside down. They've, they, they preach Jesus, and they're ignorant, unlearned men, but, but man, there's something about them. They had been with Jesus. And so Peter is a great example for us. He's a great person in the Bible to, to look at and consider. And then he writes this letter. He writes two letters which I'm not sure if he knew that he was going to write the second letter after, before, um, you know, once he finished the first, because some of the things he says, um, he kind of, there's really does, and there's indication that oh, I'm going to write a follow-up letter. It's, it's like, this is my last letter. This is what I'm writing to you. And then later on would become Second Peter. But First Peter chapter 1, we have one of the greatest introductions, I think, in a letter that we have. Um, we know Paul's introductions. You know, he was very commonly... Uh, address. Paul would say, you know, this is who I am. This is what I've done. Um, this is where I, you know, this is kind of my, my position, if you would. And then he would say, you know, grace and peace be unto you. He'd have like a kind of a formal introduction. And Peter has that in some ways. But then, like Paul also, um, and I don't know, these guys just maybe couldn't help themselves. But as they're sitting down, they're writing this letter. And Peter writes, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and then he's going to address to their, to their writing, who he's writing to, and then he's going to spend verses 3 and 11, through 11, I think, or 12, just going off. And one of the greatest introductions, I think, in a letter, and we'll read some of it. In verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to the inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And in this you greatly rejoice through now for a little while, if, indeed, if need be, um, you have been grieved by various trials, 
the, genuine, the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it be tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving uh, the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And he'll continue on. But, but those, first two, those first two verses, man, are just full of this power. I mean, if you think of the things that Peter writes, and to me, this is one of the things that I'm confident that the Bible is inspired by the, word, by, by the Holy Spirit because Peter would never be able to write this. He's a fisherman. I mean, I'm not, I mean if you're a fisherman out there, I love you, you know, but, but fishermen, usually they're out on the sea all day, and you get a little crazy, I think. I've been, I've been fishing a few times, and, and you get out there, and you see the waves, you see the water, you don't know, you know, the boat's rocking, you start to kind of lose your mind, like, what am I doing? Uh, for me, I get sick every time, but, but, you know, it's not that, like, Peter had gone to some crazy, awesome writing school and said, you know, I'm going to become the greatest writer ever to live, or I'm going to, I'm going to use words that no one else uses and ways that no one else uses them. He's a fisherman who fishes, who fishes his whole life for a living. And he sits down, and he's had all these years of ministry, all these things that God's done in his life. He's been filled with the Holy Spirit. He's been, he's been empowered by the Holy Spirit. And he sits down and writes this, inspired by, by what God has done in his life, what God is doing. And he writes this beautiful, um, I think, introduction. Blessed be the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us to the living hope through the resurrection of, of Jesus Christ from the dead. I mean, you couldn't say it more perfectly. You couldn't describe what Jesus had done for him or what Jesus was doing in his life more perfectly than he does here. But then he goes into this, into this reality or this truth of that what was happening in the church is that they were, they were suffering greatly. That there's, there's the part of, yes, Jesus rose from the dead and there's power and there's life and there's, there's forgiveness of sins, there's heaven, there's the hope of heaven. But, but there's also another reality that they were suffering greatly. In fact, if you read the first verse, it says this, this is to the pilgrims that were dispersed. The believers had, had come over such heavy persecution that they were dispersed over all the cities um, in the Roman Empire. That's why Paul, Paul would go and he would have his many missionary trips to these different cities because, because there, were, there were Christians everywhere. The book of Acts would say, um, I can't remember exactly what chapter is in, but it would say, God would tell him, look, I have many people in this city. That, that were, even if they'd gone to a city that was unreached and pagan, a lot of times there was already believers there. Maybe they were secret believers or underground believers. They were, weren't well known, but, but there were believers in those cities that were, that were all over, Gr Greek cities and, and pagan cities, Roman influence, um, and they were, sp they were spread out everywhere. Um, we see that in the book of Acts when the persecution came in Jerusalem and, and forced them to go to Samaria and forced them to go to Judea and for, for, or, uh, uh, you know, to the uttermost pa out, you know, parts of the earth. It forced them to go out. So Peter's writing to these guys who, these believers, these, guys, these children of God who have been suffering greatly, and he says this in verse 6, If in this greatly rejoice through now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. And then this is going to be, I want to start with this because this is kind of going to be um, woven in the, in, the, in the letter. He's going to talk about the idea of suffering, but the idea of suffering bringing us to glory. He's not going to talk about replacing suffering with glory. He's not going to talk about saying, look, guys, you guys aren't going to suffer anymore. You're going to receive glory. He's talking about the idea of suffering leads to something. That suffering isn't just, you don't just suffer um, just for the sake of like you being able to suffer, but, but it's actually doing something in your life. It's actually revealing something in your life. It's bringing you to that glory. Now, he's also going to talk about another kind of suffering, a suffering that comes from the non-believer, or, or not even, I mean, he'll talk about non-believers, but also from those that are disobedient to the word. So he'll say, Right, suffering for righteousness sake and the suffering for disobedience and the differences of those and that they're not the same they're, they're not the, they're not the, they don't have the same impact in your life and so he says he uses this illustration of fire that you'll be tested with fire and be found uh, to praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus and the idea of gold purifying in the fire, going in the fire, and then the fire doing, you know, getting, getting the elements hot enough to purify the gold, and when it comes out, you have this beautiful, awesome um, color, you know, um, and that was the idea behind it, is 
listen, you have some imperfections, you have some things that you need to work out, and you're going to go through this fire, but when you come out of the fire, guess what? You're going to be pure. There's going to be a work that God's done in your life that can't be done unless you go through the fire. And throughout the Bible, you see things like that, and, and you see, you know, these, this idea of someone going through suffering to be revealed, or something in their lives needs to be revealed to, be, to, to, to grow, and to, to grow into that man of God or that woman of God that he wants you to be. So that's kind of, he's going to go, if you ever read First Peter, and I'm sure many of you have, you'll see that theme, that they're suffering, but it's going to lead to glory, that there's the, the two that go together, that they're suffering, but man, there's going to be a day where Jesus is coming, that Jesus is, that we'll see Jesus face to face, whether it's his imminent return or whether we uh, pass away and we see him face to face in heaven, that the suffering on this, in the earth is temporary, and, and not only is it temporary, but it's actually working in us, something that God wants to do in us that wouldn't have happened any other way unless you suffered. Um, and that's not really, for me, that's not really an exciting topic for me. <laughs> Like, Lord, why can I learn these lessons without suffering? <laughs> why can I learn? Why can I just, you know, just show me and just, you know, you're God. You can do anything. There's nothing that's impossible. So just, just make me who I'm supposed to be without any suffering. In fact, why don't you just make the weather really perfect for me? And this way I can just go through. I can never be too hot. I never be too cold. I never have to struggle financially. I never have to have any of my loved ones die. I never have to have any sicknesses. I never have to... You know, just, you're God, you can do it. Why don't you do that? Well, God knows that that wouldn't mean the same to us. It wouldn't, it wouldn't have impacted our lives. It wouldn't have made us into the man and the, the men and women that we are if we hadn't gone through this fire. And so he talks about that a little bit now. In chapter 4, more specifically, he kind of talks about this idea of um, Christ suffering, he begins, he says, Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, and he just spent a few verses before in verse uh, chapter 318, for Christ has also suffered uh, once for our sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, uh, being put to death in the flesh, but being made alive in the spirit. So telling them, look, Jesus died for us, he suffered, he laid down his life, and by him laying down his life produced the resurrection. Jesus can't resurrect unless he's dead, right? The idea is, that, look, we have the, the hope of, of heaven, the hope of eternal life because Jesus rose from the dead, but, but Jesus couldn't have rose from the dead if he wasn't dead. He had to endure the suffering. He had to suffer for our sake. He had to, he had to put on um, our sin, and he had to endure the cross and the suffering of that so that we might be brought to God, or that he might bring us to God and, and be made alive in the Spirit. So he says, therefore, since Christ has suffered for us in the, in the flesh, he says, arm yourselves also with the same mind. Now, this idea here, arm yourselves, would be um, kind of a military term where you would, you would literally heavily arm yourself. And, and, it's, and it's, I guess it would be similar to Paul saying, put on the full armor of God. But this would be, you know, you need to really put on some heavy, heavy armor. This is you go, you you go to the and you're looking for a sh you go to Walmart and look for the shield. They didn't have a Walmart back then, but you know you look for okay, what kind of shield do I want? Do I want you know the two inch thick one or the five inch thick? It's like I need the ten inch thick shield. Now I'm probably pretty heavy, but you know you need to arm yourself heavily. You know it's it's arm yourselves also with the same mind. Now what was the mind of Christ? We can turn to passages like, like Philippians chapter 2 or, or look throughout the Gospels of the mind of Christ. But the, 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 the idea here is that Jesus, when he came into the earth, he had, it was a purpose. That even from his early on, when, they, when he was a boy, he would tell his mom after his mom you know, left him, or Jesus was, ran away, whatever, however you want to look at it. But his mom left him and realized, oh man, where's, 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 uh, where's Jesus at? You know, we must have left him, and they go back, and they find him in the temple, and, and Jesus says, I'm about my father's business. Where else? You know, I'm here. I'm at the temple. I'm teaching or whatever, and, and I'm about the father's business. So from early on, Jesus was about the father's business and about doing what God wanted him to do. And Jesus didn't mess around. He didn't, he didn't you know, procrastinate. He didn't say, you know what, I'll get to the father's will later. He spent his whole life dedicated to doing God's will and doing it in the time that God wanted it, in the way that God wanted it. And his mind was set on one thing. His mind was set on the cross, that he came into the world for one reason only, and that was to die for the sins of the world. 
He didn't come in the world to be a carpenter. He didn't come in the world to have 12 friends roam around with them for three and a half years. Or he didn't, have, he didn't become in the world to have parents, you know, who lived in Nazareth or, um, you know, have brothers and sisters who didn't like him. You know, he, he came in the world for one purpose, and that was to suffer and to die for our sins and to rise, of course, rise from the dead. But if, think about that. If you're Jesus, you, you know, you, we don't see, we don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. We don't know what after Bible study is going to bring, you know. But Jesus, knowing all things, knowing, knowing the beginning and the end, his whole life was knowing that one day, whenever that day was going to be, and, and that he was going to be betrayed by Judas, he was going to be arrested, he was going to be put on trial, falsely accused, he was going to be beaten, he was going to be scourged, he was going to be mocked, he was going to be hung on a cross, he was, he, they were going to mock him on the cross, his friends would deny him. He, he knew all these things, and yet the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross even though he knew the pain that would, that would involve, even though he knew of the suffering that that would entail, he still did it. Now, if I've known that, like if you say, Dustin, when you leave here, um, you know, you're going to get home, you're going to get a phone call, and it's going to cause you much pain. I'm not answering my phone. I'm serious. Leave a message. <laughs> I'll listen to the message or something. I, I, don't, I, I avoid those painful things. Even if it's small, even if it's something, you know, and it's, it's, it's sometimes how I, how I deal with things or how I cope with tragedy is I just, I, it never happened. <laughs> like, I just don't even want to deal with it. And yet Jesus, knowing these things, he suffered. And, and Peter here is saying, listen, this is the mind we have to have. He says, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Now, now don't think this is, no, we're not talking about perfection or sinless, but, but the idea is you've, you've denied yourself, you, you've, um, you know, you've kind of put yourself aside and said, I'm going to continue for Jesus, that no longer should live the rest of your time in the flesh for the lust of men. Now, I love that he puts this. He says, listen, have the same mind of Christ that, that you no longer should live the rest of your time in the flesh. Now, you and I, we don't know how much time we have. When you're, when you're, you're young, um, you know, I, you know, I'm still young, but when I was younger, I, 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 I honestly don't, never really thought, man, you know, um, I, I'm never, you know, I, I don't know what 80 is going to be like. I don't even know what 40 is going to be like or 50 or whatever, you know. You don't really have this idea, you don't really have this concept of longevity or time. You just think, well, I'm just doing what I'm supposed to do, and you never really think about, um, you know, years later, years ahead, or whatever it may be, because, you know, you just don't, you don't think of those things. But when you're older, you think, man, time is short, <laughs> you know, I don't have much time. Um, I grew up in a neighborhood where you didn't, where, where people didn't live very long, the, you know, the kids at least, you know, if you were, if you were 21 years old, you were an OG, that's the second time in the Bible study, you use that term, um, but, you know, if you're, how, does, how does a 20-year-old become someone who the neighborhood looks up to? How does a 21-year-old, you know, say, when, you know, this person has, has lived and endured the hardships of the neighborhood? Well, that's because many of, of you know, a lot, not, not, you know, half or whatever, it's a small percentage, but, but many people, if you've lived in a rough neighborhood for any length of time, you, would, you have a friend that was killed in a, as a teenager, you, that's just the reality of it. If you lived in any South Sac, you know, Del Paso Heights, any, any rough neighborhood in Sacramento, you have a friend that was killed by violence. That's just, that's, that's, that's how you grow up. That's, that's acceptable. And, and you realize real quickly that time, man, it's very short. We're not sure how much time we have. And, and Peter says, don't waste it. <laughs> don't waste your life. Don't waste the, the time that you have. Have the mind of Christ. Don't waste the time living in the flesh. You, you have this time that you have on the earth, whether it's short or long or whatever it is, don't live in the flesh. You don't have much time. And he says this, he says, but for the will of God, for we have spent enough time of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles, walking in lewdness and lust and, and drunkenness. Um, and I, he put drinking parties, which... At first, when I read this, I thought, is this like a new translation? But apparently they had drinking parties back then, as they do today. Um, idolatries, and, and, you know, 
he's saying, listen, we spent enough time doing these things. We've wasted enough years. Now, I don't know your story. I don't know how, when you got saved. I know when I became a Christian, I was young, I was young but I had already done enough damage, enough damage to realize, man, I am wasting my life. I'm wasting this precious time that I have, and, and, and the things that I'm doing are, are foul and wicked, and I'm wasting time. And he says, Peter says, man, you've spent enough time doing that. Why are, you know, and, and, and really, the idea here, again, is to do the will of God instead of do the will of God. Instead of living your life like this, instead of wasting time, living in the flesh, going to drinking parties, creating drinking parties, making up drinking parties, um, done all those. Um, you know, instead of living after the flesh and doing these things that are only going to lead to corruption and, and death, then you need to do the will of God. And then he says this, in regard to these, they think it's strange that you do not run with them. I like that term because we used to use that term in my neighborhood. You know, who are you running with? Um, it's kind of a, we weren't actually running. We were more like walking very slowly because our pants were too low. Um, but <laughs> it's another topic. You know, you know, those that you were, you know, they say you, you find, they find it strange because you do not run with them in the same uh, the same foulness or the same flood of sin, the same, you know, the people look at you and say, why aren't you doing those things? And this is the point that he's getting to is, is, you know, we lived a certain life that was what that was against God. And we need to stop living that way and do the will of God because the time is short. And when that happens, when you, when you have the mind of Christ and you say, I'm going to, I'm going to put on my, I'm going to take up my cross. I'm going to follow Jesus. People are going to look at you weird, aren't they? Why don't you go to these things? Why don't you do this? I got saved my senior year, just before my senior year of high school, and, and, and I had a re certain reputation. And when I became a Christian, a lot of it was, oh, you're not going to go. You know, oh, you know, you should go to this party or you should do this thing. And when you say, no, I'm not doing that anymore, those people who were your friends now mock you. Now say, well, why aren't you doing that? Well, because I don't want to spend my night throwing up all over myself or I don't want to be passed out, or I don't want to wake up feeling terrible, or, I, or whatever the case may be. And, and, you, and your friends will be like, oh, you don't like to have fun. It's like, really? What'd you do? So you got sick, and you threw up. Then you had a really bad headache the next day, and then you were dehydrated, or, you know, if you have some really crazy friends. So you spent the night in the hospital getting your, pump, your stomach pumped, or you forgot where you were, or you had a bad trip, and and, and now you're, you're messed up, like, that doesn't sound like fun to me, you know? And so what Peter here is saying is, listen, don't waste your time with that. And when you don't, people are going to look at you strangely. They're going to say, what's wrong with you? How come you don't do these things? How come you're not like this anymore? And they're going to speak evil of you. They're going to say bad things about you. And it says, they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. So that's, the, that's the, the, the assurance that we have. It's like, you know, people are going to judge you or, or maybe not judge you, but really um, speak evil of you. They'll call you self-righteous. They'll call you a do-gooder. They'll call you a Bible thumper. They'll say all these things about you, but they'll stand before God like you'll stand before God. And the reality is, is one of us is right. And I think, at least in my experience, the people who who live in this way, who live after the lust of their, their flesh and live for these things, that they're scared that if I'm right, they're in deep trouble. And they don't want anything to do with me because they think, well, if he's right, then I'm, 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 I'm doomed. And so one of us, you know, we're both going to stand before God, but one of us is going to, Jesus is going to say, well done and good and faithful servant. The other one is going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. And so that's, that's, that's the reality of it. That's what's happening here. It's the same today as was in Peter's day. God is going to judge. Now, this is, the, is what, the point that he's making in this little section. He says, for this reason, the gospel is preached. This is the reason why we preach the gospel, because people are living in such a way that, that is destroying their lives, and they're going to stand before God one day. And the reality is, if you don't know Jesus, then you're going to, you're going to fall short of entering into heaven. And, and Peter says, this is why we preach. We preach the gospel because, because people are going to stand before God and they need to know Jesus. And I like this because, you know, people will say, 
uh, or they'll have people who don't know Jesus will have a perception. Oh, you're just preaching. You just don't want me to drink anymore. You just don't want me to party anymore. You don't want me to have any fun. And, and we need to be careful because, because I'm not preaching. When I share with my friends or people I know who live in that lifestyle, I'm not, I'm not, I don't, I'm not saying you need to stop drinking. You need to stop doing drugs because that doesn't mean anything to them. Because if you would have said that to me, I would have said, why? <laughs> but when you go to someone and say, you need Jesus, you need to give your life to Jesus because you're going to stand before him and you need to know that you're going to heaven. Well, that's a game changer. Because if you, you, you point people to Jesus and say, look, your need is, is not to stop drinking, not to stop doing drugs, not to stop doing parties. Your need is Jesus. And once you receive Jesus, those other things will change. Those, you won't want to do those things. They'll be meaningless. If, if someone said, Dustin, you need to clean your life up and then come to Jesus, I would have never come to Jesus because I had no reason to clean my life up. There was no, no purpose for cleaning my life up. But when you introduce Jesus to people, when you preach to those who are dead, um, he says, for this reason, the gospel is preached also to those who are dead, that they might be judged according to the men in the flesh, but live according to, the, to God in the spirit. So that's kind of the, the first part of this section. Now he's been, he's, he's touched on suffering here and there, but, but this is kind of a, he spends a lot of time in this, this idea of suffering for, for righteousness sake or for doing good. You know, you spend a lot of time doing bad things and now, now you've given your life to Jesus and people are going to mock you for that. They're going to make fun of you. Um, but, but don't, you know, God will take care of him. God will judge him. And now he says this, but the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one another. So he's saying, in light of all these things, what should we do? Be serious and watchful. Now, this idea of being serious, um, you know, don't think of it as like you need to walk around with like a serious face. Like, I'm really serious right now. I don't know if, I don't even know if that's a serious face or not, but, you know, you look, like, real intense. I, and when I think of and serious, I think, man, someone's just really intense, you know? And I think naturally, I think my face, the way it's built, is, is kind of intense already. Um, so I don't really need to add on more, more of that, you know, seriousness. But the idea is taking your life serious. The things that you're doing, what is your life about? Is your life about pleasing yourself? Is the li- your life about about doing what, what, um, what is, you know, comfortable for you? Is your life about just getting by and not really um, sacrificing it all? Or is your life about Jesus? And I think we live in a time, and we'll, talk, we'll finish, you know, we'll, later on we'll finish kind of um, in that idea of, of the time that we live in. But, you know, we live in a time where it's not, it's not the time to, to be a fake Christian, it's not the time to be a, a lukewarm Christian. I mean, not that there ever was a time, but certainly now is not the time. And to think, you know, it's not, am I taking my relationship with Jesus serious? Because if I'm not, then what, what value does it have? What if I didn't take my, my relationship with my wife serious? I say, you know, I, I know I'm married. Yeah, I'm married, that's kind of, a, kind of a cool thing. Whatever, you get up, people come, they give you gifts. That's kind of cool. I still have some of the gifts some of you guys got me. I use them. You know, uh, you know, but I don't really take it serious. I don't really, I don't really think, you know, maybe, I, 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 maybe I'm not as faithful or, or, or diligent to the things that I should be. I don't really take it serious. Do you think my marriage will last very long? No. So what, what, what makes me think if I don't take my relationship with Jesus serious that I'm going to have any impact in this world or any effect on my family or any effect on the people surrounding me? if I don't take my own relationship with Jesus serious. So it's not of, you know, we need to be Christians and walk around with a scowl and be serious about, about what we're doing. But the idea is our life needs to, to say, you know what, my relationship with Jesus is a serious one. And the idea here is watchful. And I love Peter, and you can see this in John as well, and, and Peter as well. Um, you'll, you'll see phrases that they'll use that you'll, you'll you know, if you study the Bible for any length of time, it will kind of, your ears will perk up when you hear words like watchful or blessed or things like this, because you know that Peter has to be thinking, man, that day I fell asleep in the Garden of Gethsemane, and Jesus says I need to watch and pray. 
that day where Jesus started to tell us about, about the time, the end, the end of the, you know, the tribulations and the trials that will come in the last days and that I need to be watchful. And Peter writing this word, watchful, being watchful in prayer, being, being one who's, who's I'm, I'm about the Father's business, I'm going to walk with Jesus, and I'm going to be watchful in, in, in my prayers. And then above all these things, he says, have fervent love for one another. And then he, he quotes the proverb, um, love will cover a multitude of sin, or the proverb says will cover all sin. Um, I think hatred, uh, ha- hatred stirs up grief or something like that. It's Proverbs 10, 12, I, I think. So you can look that up later. But, um, but the idea is, look, love covers your, a multitude of sin that, that you and I could, could maybe have a disagreement or maybe you like something that, uh, or you don't like something that I said or something that I do or whatever, that because of love, we can kind of overlook those things. Now, he's not talking about sin. He's not saying, man, if you're, just, if you're cheating on your wife, man, that's just love covers a multitude of sin, guys. Come on, just love on them. Don't even worry about it. It's all good. No, we're not talking about that. But the idea is that, look, love has to be the, the, the priority, that Jesus himself would say, you know, there's two commandments I give you, that you love God and you love, love each other, you love one another. First John, we're in First John on Wednesday nights. So much of that, that whole book is about God's love and how, our, our, how we need to love like God because God is love. And if we don't love like God, then we're not of God, you know. And, and there's, there's these truths about that love has to be the very top, has to be the top priority, has to be there in our relationships, um, as Christians, if if all of us treated each other that way, that love just covered most of the sin, man, there wouldn't be any gossip in the church. There wouldn't be any 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 um, jealousy or envy or strife or or any hatred. They would just say, you know what, man, he's he needs grace like I need grace, or he needs love like I need love. And so he's saying, love will cover most of the sin. Now and he says, be hospitable to one another without grumbling. I like this because I do hosp- hospitality. And I always think, man, if, what if you guys came up on Sunday morning and we just said, what kind of muffin you want? <laughs> what kind you have? Well, they're right here. You got blueberry or you got chocolate. Pick one. I mean, you think, well, what kind of church is this? You know, what kind of coffee is this? It's coffee. Or what kind of coffee do you guys offer? The brown kind or whatever, you know, like. You know, you just when you're when you're when you're around someone who's hospitable but they're grumbling, it's just not fun to be around them. It's not pleasant. If you came to my house and you say, "Man, it's 110 degrees outside," and I said, "Well, there's a hose out backyard. Do you want some water?" That's not very hospitable, right? Now I grew up on hose water, so I don't mind it. But um, but you know, it's not very hospitable. You know, can I get a glass of water? Oh, I guess there's a drought. I mean, come on. You want me to give you a glass of water? You know, as a Christian, Peter's saying, listen, love needs to cover multiple sins. We need to love each other. We need to be hospitable without grumbling, without complaining, without it being a burden, but just be hospitable. Be nice. You know, one of the things I remember Rich doing marriage counseling, he said, said to, to me one, um, in one of the sessions, he said, you know, Husbands, or he goes, marriages would, would, do, would do a lot better if husbands just were nice to their wives. And I thought, what a simple concept, but how true it is. Like, if you were just nice to them, I think you would get away. Like, there would be a lot of, lot of help and a lot of growth. Uh, but so many of us just don't have a hard time being nice. So be hospitable without grumbling. Each of you has received a gift. And so here's some instruction in this in, in serving the Lord. Um, Each of you have received a gift. Minister to one another as good stewards um, of the manifold grace of God. And he says, if anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. And if one ministers, let him do with the ability which God supplies. And in all things, God may be glorified through Christ or through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. So he takes this section and talks about service. So the first section we looked at talked about kind of receiving grief from people who, um, you know, you, you don't want to do the things that the world's doing. You don't want to live like the Gentiles. You want to do the, the will of God and, and people kind of giving you grief. Then he goes into to service, really, to love each other, to be hospitable, to use your gift. And he says, look, each of you guys have, have a gift. 
to, that God's given you, so use it. I mean, that's a responsibility in our church that God's given us gifts not to hold for ourselves. You know, if you have a gift of teaching or prophecy or, or evangelism or the gift of helps, um, the gift of service, that's not to, you know, for yourself. If I have the gift of service and all I do is ever serve myself, it's not a very effective gift, is it? It's like, man, I really have the gift of service. I just love serving myself, right? I just love giving to myself. I love helping myself. You know, I really love prophesying to myself. I really love, you know, giving myself mercy. I really have the gift of mercy. You know, I'm always merciful to myself. <laughs> you know, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't do us any good. He's saying, listen, you guys have a gift. Use it. Use it for the, for, for the body. And then he says, if you speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. And I like this because there's, you know, it's not the, the idea here that, man, when you speak, people better, you know, you better be bringing the best message everyone's ever heard. But there needs to be a, a reality that when you get up and you share God's word, whether you're sharing with your friend, whether you're sharing with the first graders, second graders, fourth graders, whatever it is, when you're sharing the word of God, you need to be assured that the things that you're saying are from God. That, that, that whatever, whatever moment I have, whatever opportunities I have, they need to be, I need to know that, listen, this is from God. You know, I teach fourth and fifth grade, and I have been for many, many years now, and I realize, I didn't know this really in the beginning, but now that I've done it for a while, I realize you have a very, very short window of opportunity with these kids. Like, the class may be an hour long, but you got about 10 minutes of their attention. And if that 10 minutes isn't speaking the oracles of God, then I've failed. If, if I take that 10 minutes that they're actually paying attention and we play games that 10 minutes, I failed. I need to, you know, we may play games for 20 minutes or, or whatever you may have the, the kids play area, but when they're in the classroom, we, I have an opportunity to share the word of God with them. And every week, I take it very serious, saying, listen, these kids need to know that God loves them, that Jesus died for their sins, that he rose from the dead, that he lo- wants a relationship with them. Now, they're not going to look at me and say, Dustin, you are the most profound fourth and fifth grade Bible teacher I've ever heard in my life. When you speak, the oracles of God are coming out of your mouth. They'll, they don't even know that word, okay? But they'll know the truth. <laughs> they, when they hear the truth, they'll know the truth, and the truth will set them free. And they'll know that what they're hearing is from God. So when you speak, speak the oracles of God, and anyone ministers, let them minister with the ability that God's given them. Now, we're going to end with this. This last section, verse 12, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as some strange thing happening to you. Now here's, here's a, um, a very common thing when we are suffering, when we're going through suffering. We think we're the only ones that are going through it. We think that we're the only ones that this is happening to. And, and, and I don't say that to diminish the suffering. I just say that for myself, because I think when I'm in a situation, I think no one understands what I'm going through. No one understands the, the trials that I have. No one understands the difficulties that are happening. Um, and, and you can get into this idea that, man, this is weird. Like, this is strange that this is happening to me. God, don't you know who I am? Why is this trial happening to me? And, and Peter says, listen, don't think of it as some strange thing happening to you, but rather rejoice to the extent that you are partaker, uh, you partake of Christ's suffering, that when his glory is revealed, you may be glad and exceedingly joy, and with exceeding, exceeding joy. And then he says, verse 14, if you are reproached by the, for the name of Christ, blessed are you. Now, if you underline your Bible or you, you, know, you, you do an inductive Bible study, there's, a, there's way too many rejoices and joy and blessed words in, those, in these statements. When people reproach you, happy are you. When you suffer, rejoice. You know, uh, then he said, what he says again, that you'd be glad. When you're suffering, be glad in it. Now, again, those words I don't think of when I'm suffering. I don't think, man, I'm really glad this is happening. I'm really glad my face is getting kicked in. Or I'm really, really happy that, man, this is really, my, 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 my car is doing this or whatever. You know, but Peter says, listen, when these things are happening to you, know that you are partakers of Christ's suffering. Now, this is directly in the context talking about you suffering 
um, for the gospel, for preaching the gospel, the, the trials that come against you. And, and what we need to know about this is anytime you step out, you know, to serve the Lord, we just spent some, a little bit of time talking about that, where anytime you step out and say, I'm going to be used by God, I'm going to have the mind of Christ, I'm going to, I'm going to do the will of God, I'm, going to, I'm not going to live as the Gentiles, I'm not going to live for myself, I'm going to serve others, I'm going to love fervently, I'm going to, I'm going to be hospitable, and I'm going to be happy to be hospitable. And I'm, going to, I'm just going to go for it, I'm going to charge. You can be assured that Satan is going to be there for you, that you're going to have some trials, that you're going to have some difficulties. You're going to be, man, I'm going to go preach the gospel. I'm going to drive him to his house right now. He needs to know that, that Jesus loves him. I'm going to drive to his house, and then suddenly your brand new car breaks down. Or, you know what, I'm going to, I, I finally going to get enough courage. I'm going to, I'm going to, this happened to me one time. I, I was talking with this guy who worked at a, um, a kind of a retail place. And I thought, man, I'm going to, I'm going to share with him this time. Like, I'm going to just stop messing around. I'm going to tell him Jesus loves him, this and that. I get there and the guy quit. He doesn't work there anymore. I was like, man, you know, I was like, oh, I finally got the courage to do it. And he doesn't work there anymore, you know? And so, you know, not that that's a huge trial, but it's just those, those things that happen to you. There's these, there's these roadblocks, these hindrances. When you begin to be used by the Lord or, or you decide that you're going to follow Jesus, these things happen. But Paul, or Peter here says, rejoice, knowing that, that, um, that you'll, you're partakers of Christ's suffering. Uh, verse 6, on their part, uh, he is blaspheming, but on your part, he is glorified. And he says, but let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, or evildoer, or a busybody. So here's the contrast of this. If you're going to suffer, suffer for Christ's sake. Don't suffer because you're a murderer. You know, the person in prison who's in prison for murder, and he says, man, I'm just really suffering in jail here. Man, this prison is so hard. I'm locked up in this cell six by six or whatever the sale is, you know, I'm locked up 23 hours a day, man, it's just, it's just hard. I'm suffering for Christ. Uh, no, you killed someone and you're suffering the law or whatever, you know, like we, the, the, Peter's saying, listen, don't, because you're, you know, you're saying, well, I never killed anyone. Now we know that Jesus said, if you said in your heart to someone, they're a fool, you've murdered them in your heart and therefore you're guilty. But, but then he says this, he says, uh, uh, what about, an evildoer. You uh, think of, you know, you just want to do evil. You say, well, I'm a pretty nice guy. What about a busybody? I like that Paul put this kind of a really strange contrast of murderer, evildoer, busybody. It's like, that's kind of an extreme, you know, contrast of, of, of events there. But, but what Peter here is saying is, don't be in other people's business. <laughs> You know, you get into people's business and then, and then no one likes you <laughs> because you're always in their business. You're not suffering for Christ's sake. You're suffering because you're a busybody and you need to stay out of people's business. So he says, rather, um, suffer. if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him, be, let him glorify God in this manner. And I love this. Um, there's not very many places in the Bible that you have the word Christian. We know in Antioch they were first called Christians. And I think Paul uses it once. And then here, um, or it's actually in Acts, um, uh, where... Actually, we just looked at it where, the, where uh, Paul preached the gospel, and that guy goes, you almost persuaded me to be a Christian. That's the other time that it was used, and then this time. Um, so he says, if anyone suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this manner. For in the time has come for judgment to begin in the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? And so Paul's saying, listen, if God's going to judge, guess where he's starting? starting with us. So we need to live a certain way. If God, if God isn't going to, you know, he's going to judge us, he's certainly going to judge the world, but knowing that, there's a certain way we ought to live. And I'll, we'll end with this, this idea of, you know, the, the judgment begins in the house of God, and he says, um, now that the righteous once scarcely saved, the idea was that you, that you barely saved, not that Jesus' blood wasn't enough, but if it wasn't for Jesus' blood, I had no chance of being saved. And he says, where, um, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Therefore, let, a, let those who suffer accordingly to the, will, uh, to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as a faithful creator. Again, this verse can just be taken out of my Bible. Therefore, those who suffer according to the will of God. What is Peter saying? The suffering that you may be enduring is what? The will of God. 
I don't really like that. I'll take that out. But he says this, commit their souls to him in doing good. That that's our responsibility in doing good. That the, the, the judgment starts in the house of God and that my, my responsibility is to do good. My responsibility is to do the will of God, have the mind of Christ, love people, be hospitable, do what's right, not live as the rest of the Gentiles. And, I, and, and, and if I did that, if I just did that myself and not worry about everyone else doing it, but just did it myself, man, what could God accomplish in my life? And I think, you know, we live in an age where obviously the world is getting, getting more corrupt and more wicked and things are happening that, that, that 50 years ago we would have never thought were happening. But I wonder, you know, are we equally, not equally, but there, is there some responsibility in the church of some, why some of these things are happening? Is there a responsibility, you know, if the Christians stop looking at pornography, what would, what would happen to, the, to that industry? If the Christians stop buying alcohol, what would happen to that in- industry? And I'm not saying that to judge or to put some condemnation, but I just wonder, like, I need to commit myself to God. I need to, I need to have the mind of Christ. I need to do the will of God because, listen, judgment starts in the house of God, and so if it's going to start there, then I need to do what is good and what is right and what is, what is the will of God. I can't be, I don't have enough time to waste my time with the things of the world. I don't have enough time to, to party and to do these different things. I want to be about the Father's business. So, I, my prayer tonight and my exhortation to you, and I know it's a, a long chapter and we discussed many topics and went through a lot of things, but, but this idea that, you know, there are those who suffer because they're, they're, you know, they're trying to do the will of God and it's hard and it's difficult sometimes and there's things that happen that, that throw you off course. And then there's those who are suffering because they're being disobedient to God. They're not doing what God tells them to do and they're not... They're not living how, you know, they're not living out the will of God. And my question for myself is, which one am I, which, what, which, which lane am I in? Because I want to be about the Father's business. I want, to, I want to be, I want to commit myself to God in doing good. I want to have the mind of Christ. I want to do what is pleasing in his sight, not in what's in pleasing in my sight. And if I do that, if I just take myself and do that, then man, what kind of impact could God have in this world, in my, my relatives or my loved ones or the people that I, I'm around? If I just said, you know what, I'm going to live for Jesus, what kind of impact could we have? And so I might encourage you tonight, you know, I don't know your situation. I don't know what you're going through. And, and I mean, obviously God knows. But can I encourage you to look to Jesus and commit yourself to him? And whatever suffering, whatever tr- trial that you're going through, know that it's, it's leading to glory. It's leading to this, this wonderful promise that, man, we're going to see him face to face one day. We're going to see him in all his glory. We're going to see we have the promise and the hope of heaven because Jesus rose from the dead. That he suffered and he died on the cross, but he rose from the dead. And that's our blessed hope. That's what, that's what keeps us going. Paul said, man, I, I, I'm running towards the prize I'm, I'm moving forward. I'm forgetting those things that are behind me. And if, you know, maybe you're feel, thinking that I'm suffering, my marriage is suffering, or, or my life is in a mess, or I've ruined so many different things because of the way you've lived. Well, there's great... Uh, Peter uses that word, the manifold, uh, the manifold gra- the grace of God. Manifold grace, or I can't remember how, how it's termed. But the idea is many, many layers and many different ways that God is gracious to us. So all you have to do is say, you know what, Lord, help me to be on, have the will of God. Help me to be on that track. I'm suffering because I've made, it, I've made, you know, I've made all these dumb decisions, but help me to make good decisions and commit myself to you and live for Jesus. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for um, the example that you gave us in laying down your own life. Lord, you, you, you made a way for us. You gave us, gave us such a great example for us to, to follow. And although it, it requires us to sacrifice, it requires us to look beyond ourselves, it requires us to deny ourselves, we know, Lord, that in doing that, there's great glory. Lord, there's great, there's great things that you're revealing in us. There's a great work that you're doing in us. 
So I pray for each of us in here, Lord, that you would help us to grow. Lord, I, I know for my own life, um, so many lessons come from, came from suffering, came from heartache and pain and, and difficulties. And so we pray, Lord, that you would help us to see those things, to rejoice, to have the joy um, that's inexpressible, Lord, to have, have, help us to have the peace, Lord, of God, um, that you'd help us endure the things that we're going through. And, and for those, Lord, that feel like they're suffering because of their sin, because of what they've made their life to, uh, what their life has become, I pray, Lord, that you would, um, that they would come to you, and, Lord, that they would ask for forgiveness and that they would be restored. We know that you'll restore them. We'll know that you'll, your grace is sufficient. It's, it's where sin is. Grace abounds much more. Where we know that if anyone confesses their sins, that they believe in their heart and confess with their mouth, they'll be forgiven. And so we pray, Lord, that they would repent and turn to you and live a life, Lord, that's for you, not for themselves, and not to fulfill the lusts of themselves, but to, to fulfill the will of God. So do that work in us in Jesus' name. Amen.